Well, welcome to today's uh, workshop. This is going to be a focus on uh, really what I call the transdimensional sciences of the next millennium. And it's dealing essentially with where current knowledge of science meets the science of consciousness and contact experience and puts all those things together so they make sense to people. And that's a really big task because what you find normally with this subject is that it goes as far as do UFOs exist and people then want to kick the tires on the UFOs. Well, first of all, if they had tires and that kind of landing gear, it means it's made by Lockheed Martin and my uncle's old company, Northrop Grumman, um, and it's an anti-gravity device. Secondly, um, if it's only in this dimension, meaning 3D or 4D, if you count, count time, time is the fourth, then it is an interstellar. So the first thing to get your mind around is to forget everything you know about conventional wisdom, if you've studied the UFO subject, but also what you know about conventional science, because they're both antiquated and have been purposely kept antiquated. I'll get into this in a moment. Dumb down. Uh, and what I want to do is share what I think you and the public need to know to understand what has been called the phenomenon, sort of the, this sort of meta-phenomenon of ET contact and uh, UFO phenomenon that goes beyond just the fact that they're moving at 100,000 miles per hour and can make a right-hand turn without decelerating and not kill the pilots on board with, you know, a thousand g-forces or whatever that would be. Um, because, you know, that's all very interesting, but it, it kind of begs the question of, if they're interstellar, how'd they get here? And th the fact that they're here, a priori, they use something that's beyond even post-quantum physics. And it's a little bit like going back to Thomas Jefferson's era, which was only a couple of hundred years ago, and showing him this thing, a smartphone. And there'd be no foundation for understanding this. This would be metaphysical. So to the New Age people, they say, well, it's a metaphysical thing. Well, I say, well, meta, it's meta, what, meta what? What do you mean metaphysical? Metaphysical is just a term that people use when they don't quite understand the science of a, of a phenomenon that's occurring. There is no metaphysical. It's all a level of consciousness of where you're coming from. So if you're an advanced civilization that's interstellar, by definition you're trans-dimensional. So you're dropping out of linear space-time and then you're reappearing at another point in space-time, but not in a straight line. And the comprehension of that requires a lot of humility on the part of humans, which we typically lack, but particularly scientists and theologians. We'll get to, get to that a little bit later. There's people with spiritual understanding. Because the, the, the paradigm is one of coming, where there is this nexus where the what the physicist Goswami described as the self-aware universe comes together with post-quantum physics and way past spin theory and string theory and where you begin to be, be very cognizant of the fact that these technologies that are interstellar are operating from a level of an understanding of the, of the cosmos and reality that is one where consciousness and the mind is present at every level, even the 3D level, because it's the only thing that explains the phenomena uh, and all the different manifestations. So I use this term TDIS, trans-dimensional interstellar, and so I just want to introduce that right off the bat. So TDIS is a term that I use for um, what we're dealing with when we look at the science of consciousness and the physics of how the spacecraft move, operate in our space, but also go from one star system to another. And, of course, in the aerospace industry, they have more colorful terms for this. 
I was flying last year to Australia and I was accidentally was put beside a man going from Sydney to Brisbane uh, who was a Northrop Grumman engineer. I said, oh, it's my uncle's old company. My uncle worked on the lunar module, the thing that landed on the moon with Neil Armstrong in it. And he says, oh yeah, that's cool, really cool. And I said, yeah, you know, he's a young engineer. And he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm here for a meeting. He says, oh. I, yeah. I said, kind of dealing with some of the stuff that you may or may not deal with. And I just opened the door a little bit. He says, oh yeah, we know what, the, we, we call that PFM. I said, what? He said, pure fucking magic. <laughs> and so, his words, not mine, uh, although I did repeat them, um, redact, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but that is why it's called PFM. But at the CIA, it's called WSFM. Have you all heard this term before? Uh, um, the first time I heard it, it was from the science director, a guy who's the, one of the top guys in the science director at CIA, who's actually been encouraged me to do what I've been doing for, since 1992, because he can't, because they'll get assassinated, so he says, you do it, if you get assassinated, who cares? Uh, <laughs> and so, so they use this term WSFM, sounds like a radio station, it stands for Weird Science and Frickin' Magic, and that is what they call this. Uh, and the Naval Research Lab people call it that. Because it, what it deals with is a type of phenomenon that when you get into a certain level of very high voltage systems, where the voltage is at a certain frequency and resonant field, and I'm not going to bore people with the arcana of this, but let's say you, you have a, a pointing vector or uh, you put an energy uh, field with, with very high voltage around an object that's a couple million volts but very, very low amperage. So there's not much power involved, but at a certain cycles per second, or hertz, resonant, and in specific resonant field, that object can be made to literally begin to resonate and then tilt out of linear space-time, and it will disappear. Now, I've been in a lab that's run near the Redstone Arsenal in Alabama, Huntsville, where I, this stuff has been done. And so, by humans. <laughs> so, but, so it's disappeared, you can't see it, and it actually has moved into another dimension, dimension 6, 10, 12, 80, 90, whatever it is. Someone asked me how many dimensions are there, I said how many numbers are there between zero and infinity? Okay, so forget about 11 dimensions, or it go, keeps going. So, uh, you know, it's like infinity goes back to infinity. We're going to get into this in a, in a later. Uh, and so the science behind this has really been studied somewhat accidentally in the early days by Faraday, uh, Maxwell, Tesla. And it was uh, sort of an empiricist understanding. You know, you know what empiricism is? Empiricism is basically observational you know, uh, science. You, you observe something. Uh, it's empirical, it's tangible. Now, you may not know the theoretical behind it. And this happens in science all the time. We'll, we'll see something and we can describe the phenomenon and even the parameters of the science, but we won't understand really what it's doing. We still don't really understand how, uh, from the, the herb foxglove, um, a digitoxin works to increase contractile strength of the heart muscle, but it's been used for 100 years. And it wasn't until very recently they understood how aspirin worked, which was from the, is the bar, from the bark of a tree, is where you get aspirin from. They didn't understand how that really worked, and they still don't understand all of how it works, but it's, can, you can use it and empirically see how it works. But the understanding unfolds over sometimes decades, centuries, millennia. So I'm going to be talking about areas of science that is through a glass dimly, <laughs> and that there are certain phenomena that we can observe, but the actual full understanding of it is probably going to be unfolding over the next thousand, five thousand, five hundred thousand years, the whole next cycle we're in. So that's, that's, I want to set the stage there. And the other part of setting the stage is the humility needed to sort of approaching a subject like this. Because the biggest mistake people make is to think, we know everything. 
I know everything because I'm a physicist at MIT. Well, actually, you know, not. It's like the guy, <laughs> it's like the guy who in the late 1800s declared that we could close the patent office because everything that could be invented had been. Now, this is a true story. <laughs> so, you know, there's this hubris that goes with the human condition that's rather worrisome, which has led to the foolishness that we see today called human society. But, <laughs> but so to get past that foolish way of, of thinking, there has to be a very open mind uh, and also I'm willing to admit that we really don't understand but a tiny fraction of the cosmos around us. And the brightest and best amongst us in the working their whole lifetimes can only unfold a little bit of it. And so from that foundation of, of sort of a, a humility, then we can go and explore. And if we don't understand something, you just file it and say, well, someday we may understand this. But don't discount it. Because it's often the things that are discounted because it's not fitting into the box of the current paradigm of science or religion or thought that gets chucked out. And that's where the good stuff is. Um, that's the really good stuff. And often people who do begin to explore those things get persecuted. Like the University of Virginia, we have our farm out near University of Virginia. And there was a medical doctor who um, discovered that there was a bacteria, H. pylori, that causes a lot of the really bad bleeding ulcers. And it ran against the theory that it was just too much acid. And that if you took a course of this and that medicine instead of the acid medicine or with it, it would cure them without surgery or anything. He got run out of the country, ended up in Australia. Australia was the only place he could get a job. He ended up getting the Nobel Prize. But, it, but the initial reaction of the scientific fundamentalist paradigm, the high priests of science, were to say, no, it can't be because we know everything about how this works. Well, it turns out they didn't know anything about how ulcers worked. So the same is true in physics, the same is true in materials, and the same is true in, in theological thought and consciousness studies. So I think that's why we have to sort of enter this whole subject with that kind of perspective. Then you can at least begin to explore with, with something resembling an open mind uh, and, and learn something. The other thing to understand is that almost everything that I'm going to talk about today has been known in some classified project or another for a very, very long time. It, but in pieces, maybe not put together this is the way I'm going to present it. My job is to sort of synthesize it and connect the dots, which is my job today is really to connect all these dots for you guys. So that, so that you leave here understanding, wow, that's why an ET craft does that, or that's why I had this experience in a contact moment, or that's what the future of energy and technology is going to be, uh, and, and a deep understanding. Now, what I will try to avoid is too much technical jargon because it's, 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 this is a, not a group of physicists, but, uh, and I'm just a country doctor from Virginia anyway, so we'll, we'll sort of avoid, that's my line when I've done things at the Pentagon. I'm just a country doctor from <laughs> Virginia. But you have to, uh, you know, feel in your heart that the knowledge can be understood even if it's not in all the technical aspects, the concepts. So if you get the concepts, then you can move into what I call an operational paradigm. And the operational paradigm means that you can put together the phenomenon you see and your own experience and consciousness and thought and do something with it. Which, of course, the outgrowth of that is the CE5 initiative, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, where humans use consciousness and thought to interface with interstellar communication systems and make contact. And that's, that's the really exciting stuff.